Hi all, let's have a look at another amazing game from TSAC, Season 19 Super Final. So Stockfish was playing white in round 6, and the game kicked off with e4, and Lila played e6. We have the same position in reverse as the previous round, which Lila won. So the question is, could Stockfish exact a revenge from this position after e5, knight g8? Now here, this is the end of the book, so Stockfish is on its own resources and has to play from this position and actually starts with a3. And although this hasn't been played in human over the board games, it does seem much better than f4, which there was once a game Tegram Petrosian drew with f4 with an early exchange of light square bishops. And there is another example game I'd like to show you actually here where black actually won, just to add a bit more interest about this variation. With c5, uh, this game is Fam against Admiral, played in Maastricht 2019, where black managed to use the f5 square. And that seems a pretty much the downside of playing f4. This structure seems as though it could actually justify black's position quite significantly. This structure seems fairly pleasant for black. Uh, so black played f6, and here, of the bishop takes, white slipped up a bit with queen takes f2, doubtful move, maybe rook takes f2, and white has the advantage technically. But after queen takes f2, black went on to win this game in 48 moves. So it wasn't pure torture playing from the provocative start position, but that's with f4. I believe a3 has a got a lot more bite to it, actually. Stockfish on its own resources plays the move a3 here, which is very interesting. Hasn't been seen much in human over the board games, but it seems well designed against c5 actually. If black plays c5 here, then d takes, and it's a knight c6, b4. This position seems rather nice for white with knight h3, believe it or not. So even though knight's interfering with knight f3, knight h3. And white's doing really well in this position. This could be a total novelty idea, which is why this a3 hasn't really been taken seriously. Uh, if knight h6, then knight b5, and black's in a very bad way indeed. So how does how does black actually react to this a3 uh, after c5 and d takes c5? It's kind of intriguing. If bishop takes c5, queen g4 hits g7. And this kind of position is very pleasant for white. So yeah, it's it's very, very interesting how a3 can cope, in my view, with this move c5. So black here, Leela, plays actually b6. And we have knight c e2, shielding against an immediate exchange of light square bishops. c5 now knight f3, bishop a6, h4, h6, h5. So white does seem to be pressing down on the king side and using the h3 square rather creatively is a thing which both engines seem to enjoy here with the white pieces. Knight c6, c3, queen d7, rook b1, we have knight g e7, and now b4. There's an interesting aspect to black's position here that the dark squares are under pressure and actually there's an immediate threat of b5 here forking two pieces so that has to be addressed as well but the dark square pressure is pretty unpleasant here we see bishop c4 and in fact there is a temptation just to win a pawn here and you might think well doesn't that just fragment white structure significantly but Stockfish did take on c5 and did play d takes c5. And this is kind of unpleasant actually for black. It looks unpleasant for white structurally, but white has that d4 square, in fact. That's one micro upside, the d4 square. The other one is, well, rather, it's not a micro downside that much sometimes, the e5, because sometimes that might be able to be reinforced with a rook coming to h5 if ever h5 leaves 
that might not be such an issue as previously kind of perceived if this has ever reached an over the board chance disposition. So this D takes C5, it looks a little bit um, dicey <laughs> to say the least, as in dicing the pawns. But it's kind of scary how things could evolve from here, especially with that D4 square. It's kind of Nimzovician in that giving up sometimes the center in terms of pawn occupation and replacing it with pieces was mentioned by Nimzovich. So we see Rook B8, Bishop E3, and also, you know, the strength of the move is, is not in how beautiful it looks, but in its functionality. So here, the functionality of using d4 is, is very interesting. We have rook takes, queen takes, and now g5. This does give another potential outpost square, h5 to white. But what is black actually doing here if black doesn't commit to g5? It's a bit of a tricky position, really. If bishop takes e2, black's just asking for trouble on the light squares. This is just going to be painful. For example, like this, forget even recapturing. There's time to celebrate now the, the light squares winning. That would be just absolutely terrible. Uh, but just to demonstrate further with knight takes, if white gets that extra pawn there, and the light square bishop is a killer again, you know, threatening checkmate there, forcing f5, that has zero counterplay. So I'm not really sure what black is supposed to be doing here. It seems quite quite the bind already. Uh, so yeah, we have this g5 move being played. And it does give white seemingly an interesting square to use now, h5, because knight takes g6 was played, not fg. I mean, fg just looks terrible in other respects <laughs> uh, okay so knight takes g6 we can actually check a concrete line with fg knight f4 would be dangerous so here bishop takes king takes this position with knight d4 now points at e6 and here this is just very very nice for white so okay so knight takes gives white the h5 square which helps reinforce e5 which makes it more of a nag to try and get one of these pawns back. In natural sort of human over the ball play, one generally thinks, oh, that's fine if they do that. They're an inexperienced player. If they do D takes, you can recollect the pawn usually as a French defense player. And you get interest on that investment usually. But here, I don't know anymore. After rook h5, bishop g7, this is actually rather annoying after knight ed4. Okay, black does actually get a pawn back here, but at what cost? There's actually now a dangerous C pawn. As Linzovich said, past pawns are like criminals, criminals. They need to be kept under lock and key. So we have here knight C takes E5. If knight G takes E5, knight takes, knight takes this position, there's a lot of pressure on E5. And here, yeah, it looks for a moment as though Maybe black's okay, but that pass pawn is so, so dangerous. For example, like this, it can really do a lot of damage in these variations. So let's go back. So knight c takes e5 was played. Knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, knight takes, and now bishop f4. And this seems very uh, cruel, this move, as though e5, although tempting, it just cannot be played for technical reasons. Queen d8 is played. If e5 here, knight f5 hits the g7 bishop. If e takes, then queen b8 is actually stronger than taking immediately. And this position is just terrible for black. Uh, it's going to be absolutely a big advantage for white there. So e5, let's have a look at that again. If bishop f6, queen b8 check, queen b5 check, c6, and then taking on h6 is even possible. It's just black's getting dismantled. That's the, the problem here. Uh, black is actually getting dismantled in these scenarios. So, okay, so queen d8 was played. So the queen was on d7. It's actually going back to d8. And we have here queen b5 check. 
and now c6 queen b6 but now c7 queen takes knight takes king e7 knight takes a7 so threatening c8 bishop takes c3 check king e2 knight b6 okay and you might think well that pawn is it such a terrible criminal to be put under lock and key how can white progress this pawn or the pawns in general they both seem absolutely useless but like liquid terminator in <laughs> terminator 2 uh, these pawns are about to reform reshape <laughs> it's like they you know the structure has been destroyed but actually only to be recreated sh soon after rook h3 hitting the bishop bishop f6 rook b3 we see knight c8 and now knight c6 check knight b8 check a4 and this all of a sudden is a really dangerous pass pawn and of course the knight has disconnected the rook from a8 that's pretty ominous we have e5 bishop d2 rook g8 a5 rook g4 trying to get the tarash rule invoked get behind the pass pawn rook b7 rook a4 but now knight a6 and it's all very very tactical now rook c4 is played if d4 as an example rook b8 this position there's knight c5 check and then rook takes and then knight takes winning a piece so it's very very tricky we have rook c4 knight b4 king d6 but now a spectacular move which really is crushing black can you see what white plays here stockfish played a fantastic move if i give you five seconds to pause the video what would you play here okay yeah re rook b6 it reforms the pawns into two connected past pawns knight takes has to be played because if king e7 knight takes d5 check winning the bishop of the house so knight takes and we have two connected past pawns which are very difficult to blockade indeed rook takes c7 just giving back you know giving up material basically giving up what can uh, black do here if king d7 just b7 for example it's it's pretty hopeless the two connected past pawn potential it's queening there so we have rook takes c7 and clearly stockfish is just the piece up knight takes d5 without too much compensation end of game well <laughs> so what philosophically do we get from this game i have to say it's it is a bit in a way dynamic hypermodernism to give up your literal literal occupation of pawns Nimzovich has demonstrated that back uh, a long time back about d takes c5 in general and trying to occupy with pieces after as a replacement for pawns and sometimes pawns can just be just weaknesses in the center so sometimes you do want to just control the center with pieces and that can be you know achieved later later after you occupy first with pawns you can replace with pieces or immediately you can start the game in a hyper modern fashion and just point your pieces at the center but here yeah th there's a kind of <laughs> terrible ugliness about the fragmentation though i felt at one point from one perspective but on the other hand it's the functionality which creates the beauty the functionality of being able to use the d4 square and of actually having a very dangerous pass pawn emerge the one on c5 uh very very dangerous indeed as it turned out and the pawns actually reformed like the liquid terminator in terminator 2 <laughs> so it wasn't it was a uh, much more dangerous than it pretended to be it seemed so stockfish and then phenomenal or well, absolutely brilliant achievement by the stockfish team got its revenge exacted its revenge so to level the score after this game in round six so the match is very very exciting follow the action at tsec-chess.com uh, by the way, I have a new course at Udemy, King's Crusher TV slash Opening Tango. Well worth checking out. 4.8, really good rating. Uh, there's a bit.ly slash 
Leela Chess Playlist, bit.ly slash Stockfish Chess. There's King's Crusher TV Discord chat. And if you want to invite me for a game, bit.ly slash Chess Bowl, just register there and I'll be able to invite you for a game. Now, the highly important trivia question today, would you rather watch Star Wars or Star Trek if you had to choose? So that's today's question. <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek, if you have to choose, what would you watch? And I guess, you know, you could choose any of the of the, of the motion pictures or whatever. So, uh, or, or the series. Star Wars or Star Trek. Okay, comments, questions, like, share, subscribe with the notification bell. Always appreciate it. Thanks so much.